Hi guys, Dr. Patil here and welcome to the Prep Ladder Neat SS. In this tiny video module, we will be addressing respiratory failure. From the Neat SS exam perspective, all that is important is you should be able to differentiate between the four different types of respiratory failure based on the ABG parameters and patient's clinical story. That's it. So we are going to keep this module very compact. We are all familiar that there are four types of respiratory failure, four types, and they are named as type 1, 2, 3, and 4. Type 1, we also call it as hypoxic or hypoxemic respiratory failure. Then type 2, we call it as hypercapnic respiratory failure. We will discuss more in detail about this in a bit. Hypercapnic respiratory failure. Type 3 and type 4 are not specific types of respiratory failure as such. In terms of ABG, they might resemble hypoxic or hypercapnic respiratory failure. Type 3 mostly resembles hypoxic, type 4 mostly resembles hypercapnic. But because they have specific etiology and pathophysiology underlying them, which has an implication on how we manage those patients, we are naming them separately. So type 3 respiratory failure is a respiratory failure due to atelectasis of the lung. Atelectasis of the lung in peri or post-operative period. In peri or post-op period. Okay. And type 4 respiratory failure is due to Reduced perfusion of the respiratory muscles, perfusion of respiratory muscles due to shock, due to shock, okay. So we will discuss first the type 1 and type 2 in detail and then we will address type 3 and type 4, okay. Now coming to type 1 respiratory failure, as we know it is called as hypoxic respiratory failure and we have to remember that whenever we talk about type 1 respiratory failure it's a pure hypoxic respiratory failure it is a respiratory failure where hypoxia is there the blood levels of the oxygen is decreased po2 is reduced spo2 is reduced but there is no hypercapnia if the hypercapnia comes into picture that becomes type 2 respiratory failure right so in these patients the pao2 is decreased but pco2 paco2 or pco2 can be either normal or decreased. It cannot be increased. Okay. So basically it means that the oxygenation of the blood is affected. So this is primarily a defect of oxygenation. Right. Oxygenation defect. Now what can cause the oxygenation defect? What can make sure that the oxygen of the blood is not happening well? Okay. The possibility is let us look at what is happening in the gas exchange at the level of alveolar capillary membrane. So we draw in a lot of oxygen into the alveoli and we receive the blood from the right side of the heart through the pulmonary artery to the capillaries which are lining the alveoli which is carrying blood rich in carbon dioxide. Okay, So this carbon dioxide during the gas exchange gets exchanged into the alveoli and is exhaled out through expiration and the oxygen makes its way into the blood and it is carried through the blood right attached to hemoglobin now if you reduce the flow of oxygen into the alveoli can it cause hypoxia yes if the amount of oxygen coming to alveoli is reduced then the amount of oxygenation of the hemoglobin is also going to get reduced right so that is the first scenario so this oxygenation can be defective in scenario number one when there is decreased FiO2 decreased FiO2 Okay, or the other possibility under the same scenario is decreased minute ventilation. Minute ventilation. So the two possibilities, right? One is that amount of oxygen coming into the alveoli is reduced though the amount of inspiratory effort is normal and the amount of the total gas that is coming into the alveoli is normal. That typically occur when the FiO2 is low, right? When can it occur? Under two circumstances. One is when you are in an environment where the ambient oxygen is low as in case of high altitude high altitude the percentage of oxygen in the air itself is low right that's one scenario or second is iatrogenic so someone some patient who is on ventilator or is being administered general anesthesia and inadvertently we don't give him adequate oxygen or machine failure or something like that that can contribute so it can be iatrogenic or it can be because of high altitude now talking about the decreased minute ventilation minute ventilation is what the amount of total air coming to the alveoli. So that can happen when you have a failure of respiratory muscles, right? When the respiratory muscles are not able to do their job, uh, you, will, you will be able to draw less amount of air into the 
alveoli. The percentage of oxygen is normal, FiO2 is normal, but the net ventilation is reduced, hypoventilation is occurring. Now, please remember that that can cause hypoxia, but most of these patients eventually will have difficulty in clearing the carbon dioxide also because the, the total ventilation is reduced, hypoventilation is there. So, oxygenation is reduced and eventually they find it difficult to clear the carbon dioxide. So, the carbon dioxide gets carried to systemic circulation without uh, significant exchange. So, these patients will eventually become type 2 respiratory failure. But in the beginning, they might have type 1 respiratory failure, right? Okay. So, that is one scenario. Then the second condition where it can occur is when there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay. Now, before going to that, see, I have come across various books, textbooks, apps and notes which mention that the alveolar and arterial oxygen gradient, what we call as AA gradient, is always increase in type 1 respiratory failure, which is a false notion. It can be normal, it can be increased. I'll tell you why. See, now the scenario that we were talking about. The FiO2 is reduced or minute ventilation is reduced. So the amount of oxygen on the alveolar side is reduced and that is why the oxygenation of the blood is reduced. This is happening in proportionate decrease. Ventilation reduced or FiO2 in the alveolar reduced. Proportionate decrease in the oxygenation of the blood happens. So the alveolar arterial gradient remains normal. So in these circumstances, a, a gradient can be normal gradient can be normal. So please remember that it's not always that you have uh, alveolar arterial oxygen gradient to be increased. Okay, but whenever there is ventilation perfusion mismatch, you can have, right? The <clears throat> VQ mismatch, the example I can quote is pulmonary embolism or the atelectasis of the lung, which is like there are lung areas which are consolidated or collapsed. There is no adequate oxygenation, perfusion is maintained, but because this blood is going, right, these alveoli are collapsed. So this blood is going without oxygenation because the alveoli are collapsed. You can have hypoxia or you can have circumstances where alveoli are well ventilated, but the amount of blood coming to these capillaries is reduced because a clot somewhere proximally, pulmonary embolism, right. So I can quote an example here, pulmonary embolism or atelectasis okay in these patients what would be happening with AA gradient take the example of pulmonary embolism in pulmonary embolism oxygen here is going to be normal right so A is normal but oxygen in the blood is getting affected so AA gradient is going to be increased so in pulmonary embolism AA gradient is going to be increased that's what you will see in pulmonary embolism patients Okay. Now, what will happen in case of atelectasis? In atelectasis, there is a segment of alveoli where the alveolar oxygenation is reduced and that has contributed to reduced oxygenation of the, of the blood, right? So, A gradient there, it can be again turned out to be normal, right? Okay. So, that is about VQ mismatch. The third circumstance is when you have a diffusion defect diffusion defect so when you have parenchymal disease like say interstitial lung disease or ARDS or pulmonary edema or even for that matter consolidation of the lung in all these cases the gas exchange the alveolar ventilation is normal right and your perfusion is normal but the the alveolar arterial or the capillary membrane is not efficiently able to participate in the gas exchange because of these parenchymal lung diseases, right? So the oxygen is not able to diffuse into this. Typical example is ARDS where the, there is a thin membrane formed here with all the, the debris of dead cells and increased mucus production. So it is acting as a barrier for diffusion of oxygen. So these are the typical examples. So what will happen to the AA gradient in these patient? Alveolar ventilation is normal. So A is normal. But because the diffusion is not happening, the arterial side of this is affected or reduced. The oxygenation of the artery is reduced. So they have an increased alveolar and arterial gradient. Right? So A is normal. 
this is decreased so the net result is increased AA gradient clear so please now note that in case of type 1 respiratory failure you can either have a normal AA gradient or increase AA gradient it's not always increased AA gradient okay clear okay so this is about type 1 respiratory failure <clears throat> now causes I have already listed coming to the type 2 respiratory failure type 2 respiratory failure is a condition where often hypoxia is there PO2 is reduced but the main finding here is carbon dioxide levels PaCO2 is increased and to say it has increased it should be more than 50 millimeters of mercury when it is more than 50 millimeters of mercury you can call it is increased PaCO2 is increased right so whenever you have a patient with respiratory failure where PaCO2 is increased even whether hypoxia is present or not it is invariably type 2 respiratory failure okay under what circumstances it can occur see going back to that alveolar membrane image that I had drawn okay the main reason why carbon dioxide clearance gets affected is when there is hypoventilation that's the main reason why hypoventilation occurs or why hypoventilation affects carbon dioxide see when we had uh, this little bit of membrane problem diffusion issues carbon dioxide retention was not happening the reason is carbon dioxide very easily diffuses oxygen finds it more difficult to diffuse through so any any minor illness will cause hypoxia but carbon dioxide has easy diffusibility because it has easy diffusibility it will easily escape into the alveoli and gets cleared out but if the ventilation is reduced right the respiratory effort is reduced that will cause the carbon dioxide retention because you are not putting sufficient effort your, your uh, uh, minute ventilation is reduced so hypoxia will be there but even the carbon dioxide clearance gets affected right so there are three circumstances in which the type 2 respiratory failure can occur one I, as I have told you hypoventilation is the main problem right hypoventilation can occur if the respiratory center which is acting as a pacemaker for your respiration is affected one thing right the second situation is uh, when you have the respiratory muscles being affected respiratory muscles are weak so they are not able to generate sufficient respiratory efforts either re respiratory drive is not coming from your central nervous system or the respiratory center or you have reduced effort from the respiratory muscles which can be because of a muscle disorder nerve muscle junction disorder or neurological causes or even the chest wall deformity or the third you can say lungs and this uh, alveolo capillary membrane as an effector organ so if you have a problem at the level of lungs which is unable to allow the carbon dioxide clearance there also you can have carbon dioxide retention so th three possibilities so in terms of causes now defects in respiratory generator which is nothing but your central nervous system respiratory disorder so you can have a cns lesion causing respiratory failure right especially the lesions affecting the brain stem okay then certain metabolic disorders can affect the respiratory drive right typical example i can quote is hypothyroidism mixed edema hypothyroidism mixed edema okay then the cns suppressant drugs cns suppressant drugs which can include like drugs like morphine right drugs like morphine and anesthetic agents all of them anesthetics all of them okay that's one set apart from that if you have a problem with the chest wall or chest wall problem so the chest wall is not able to the muscles are not able to contract it could be neuromuscular or it could be purely muscular so it can be part of myopathies and myositis or muscle disorders right disorders of nerve muscle junction like gb syndrome it can also occur in other neurological disorders like polio poliomyelitis patients with transverse myelitis right and also remember that the chest wall deformities like scoliosis these are all going to be contributors okay i also forgot to mention the electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemia right hypokalemia can affect your muscle function hypomagnesemia hypokalemia spinal cord lesions especially at the cervical levels all of this can affect the respiratory muscle effort okay and coming to the effector organs lungs if you have a problem in the lungs that can also be the reason for impaired carbon dioxide exchange right so most important example we should quote is obviously COPD and under the COPD it is mostly the patients with chronic bronchitis who are likely to 
develop this kind of type 2 respiratory failure. Patients with the emphysema variant generally develop type 1 respiratory failure. Right? It is a chronic bronchitis patients where the carbon dioxide exchange is affected because of the persistent inflammation. They can develop type 2 respiratory failure. Okay. Apart from that, you have to remember very severe asthma. Very severe asthma where the respiratory effort, the, the hypoxia that started in the moderate to severe form of asthma has progressed to a point where the patient is getting into a stage of shock. There is increased respiratory effort, but inadequate oxygenation of the respiratory muscles and the respiratory muscles are going into fatigue. Those patients will have type 2 respiratory failure, which is al already a bad ominous sign. Okay. And conditions like ARDS can progress to become type 2 respiratory failure. They start with type 1 respiratory failure, but over time when the lung parenchyma is severely affected, hypoxia is setting in and prolonged increased respiratory effort leads to muscle fatigue of respiratory system that can become a type 2 respiratory failure. Again, it is an ominous or bad sign, right? Okay, so that is type 2 respiratory failure. Now, what happens to the AA gradient in type 2 respiratory failure? AA gradient in type 2 respiratory failure. In type 2 respiratory failure. Okay, so largely the AA gradient in type 2 respiratory failure remains normal. These people might have hypoxia, but that hypoxia is because of the overall hypoventilation, right? The amount of the respiratory effort is reduced, so the amount of air coming to the alveoli is reduced, so the amount of oxygenation of the blood is reduced, and the amount of carbon dioxide clearance from the blood is reduced. So that's why carbon dioxide is building up, oxygen level in the blood is going low. But this decrease in oxygen level is proportionate to the decrease in alveolar oxygenation. So A gradient in type 2 respiratory failure in most cases is going to be normal. It's going to be normal. Okay. Now that's about type 2 respiratory failure. Now coming to the type 3 respiratory failure. Type 3 respiratory failure can be considered as a subset of type 1 respiratory failure. Subset of type 1 respiratory failure. Okay, so basically this is hypoxic respiratory failure only. So PaO2 in these patients is generally decreased. PCO2 or PaCO2 is normal or often decreased because of the increased washout because of hyperventilation. Now what is this type 3? Type 3 is a respiratory failure which is due to atelectasis of lungs, mostly the dependent parts of the lungs in peri or post-op period, peri or post-operative period. Why this occurs? This is typically more commonly associated with general anesthesia, patient being in OT and post-operative period for a prolonged period in supine position. And we have to remember that certain risk factors do exist, like patients who are very obese, those who have ascites. This can be considered as risk factors or contributory causative factor. So, the dependent portion of the lung is having this atelectasis occurring because of decreased FRC. Functional residual capacity of the lung is decreased. It, it is partly because of the anesthesia, but the other factors are contributing. Like being in supine position, especially having obesity or ascites, the diaphragm is pushed upwards when you have massive ascites or when you're obese. So the, the space available for the diaphragmatic descent is reduced, especially in supine position, right? And add to that anesthesia, which is reducing your functional residual capacity. It is also affecting to some extent the respiratory center. So it is sometimes depressing the respiratory effort. All that put together, the dependent parts of the lung get less ventilated. Whatever air that existed in the alveola in the dependent parts of the lung gets absorbed. And after it is absorbed, right, there is a negative pressure building up and it collapses. So you can also call it as absorption atelectasis. So once it is collapsed, it is no more participating in the gas exchange. And that is how hypoxia is occurring, right? Another important contributory factor I forgot to mention is inadequate analgesia. Inadequate analgesia especially surgery is involving abdomen and pelvis if the analgesia is not adequate then that perception of pain right will limit the patient's respiratory effort and that again contributes to this atelectasis okay now why are we recognizing this as a separate entity when we talk about treatment of type 3 respiratory failure we have to remember that it is largely preventable to some extent if you have conditioned the patient's lungs well by doing incentive spirometry before the surgery, it can be prevented to some extent. And if at all it occurs, generally it is mild. Minimal hypoxia like their SpO2 may be 88, 89. 
we can manage most of these patients with oxygenation and in situ spirometry to let that collapsed portion of the lung expand. That's it, right? So the treatment is with oxygen supplementation and incentive spirometry and chest physiotherapy. Incentive spirometry and chest physiotherapy. Okay, now talking about the type 4 respiratory failure. This is a respiratory failure due to decreased perfusion of respiratory muscles which is due to shock. Okay, typical example is cardiogenic shock but any form of shock. Cardiogenic shock or any form of shock. So please remember that when we are going through shock, especially cardiogenic shock, see most of the patients of cardiogenic shock are associated with left heart failure and thus they have pulmonary edema. So they are already having hypoxia. So the respiratory system is putting extra effort to oxygenate the blood. So they are hyperventilating, accessory muscles are in action and then add shock to it. So shock will mean that there is decreased perfusion of overall all the tissues and such a time your respiratory muscles require a lot of blood supply, right? So they end up taking 10 times the normal flow or they might consume 40% of the cardiac output. Now imagine a circumstance where the patient is in shock and 40% of the cardiac output is only being consumed by respiratory muscle. Then what will happen to the brain, liver and kidneys, the important vital organs? So the perfusion of those organs gets affected. Okay. Now when the respiratory perfusion of the respiratory muscles is decreased, their respiratory effort starts going down. So it starts causing hypoventilation. So initially there is hypoxia, eventually there is, there is carbon dioxide buildup. So these, if you have to fit into type 1 or type 2, it starts with type 1, then progresses to type 2 respiratory failure. Okay. But we are treating it as a separate entity for this reason. Okay. If you have to treat or help this patient, mainly to save other internal organs like liver, kidney and brain, you don't want the ischemic hepatitis, acute kidney injury and the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy to happen. Then you have to divert this 40% cardiac output to the other vital organs. And that is only possible when you take control of patient's respiration. So whenever you have a patient of type 4 respiratory failure, treatment is mainly mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation. This is very important because if you just give them oxygenation and try to maintain oxygen levels, it will be detrimental because the respiratory muscles will continue to consume that uh, extra cardiac output and treating shock becomes very, very difficult. So intubate, sedate the patient and put him on mechanical ventilator. Let ventilator take, in, take charge of his respiration and the other hemodynamic parameters, you will start noticing that they are improving, right? So that is why just categorizing these patients as type 1 if it belongs to that kind of ABG or type 2 if it belongs to that kind of ABG, we are creating a separate category type 4 because of this reason. Okay, so guys with that I am signing off. I will be connecting with you in the next video module on a next interesting topic. Thank you.